Welcome to the Veritas Forum, engaging university students and faculty in discussions about life's hardest questions and the relevance of Jesus Christ to all of life. I am so thrilled to be at Hope College. I've heard such wonderful things uh, about this college over the years. Um, two of the last three uh, managers of this research project at the University of Virginia have been graduates uh, of HOPE. Um, I've heard um, stories about how cool the college and town are, and uh, it's a delight to be here at last. So thanks for your hospitality and for including me in this um, very distinguished um, lecture series. Um, many thanks, too, to, uh, to uh, Grace and uh, to uh, Mark. Mark, uh, to the president and provost, of course, I had the honor of meeting you a couple of years ago in Birmingham, Alabama. Thanks all to, also to some wonderful person in CIT named Stephanie, who I didn't see, but please tell her that I love her dearly because around midnight, uh, as my computer was dying in my um, hotel room, and I realized to my horror that I left my AC adapter in Virginia, um, she pulled a miracle and, in fact, let me borrow her own. Um, so somebody should re also remind me to give that back to her tomorrow before I leave. Uh, a couple of uh, a couple of uh, points about what we're going to do together over over the next. Um, hour. Um, first of all, I should say I, I take this um, lecture as just a great honor, and I, I, I guess in some ways I can say I've been working on it for five years, even though I only got the invitation an hour and a half ago. On New Year's Eve at 11.45, I emailed my editor um, a, a manuscript of the um, bi uh, biography of Dietrich Bonhoeffer that I'm writing for Knopf, a book called Strange Glory, uh, A Life of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. I promised my editor in my contract, actually put a little in enforcement in that, um, to have a, a manuscript uh, to him by the end of the calendar year 2013. So at a quarter of, of midnight on New Year's Eve, I emailed him 880 pages and 220,000 words of a manuscript. Okay, it's not the final manuscript, but tonight I would like to read that in its entirety. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I would like to do something that we could call the fierce urgency of Bonhoeffer's uh, legacy in five acts. And I, I tell you how hard I've worked on this lecture so that, you know, if things like go to pieces in a half an hour, you can at least say, well, he really tried hard. He really worked hard on this. So join me, uh, please, as, as, we, um, as we visit um, this extraordinary uh, life and witness. So act one, eternity's child. And I finished this about 10 minutes ago. When he was a child, a young child, and his family rented a house near the Catholic cemetery in Breslau, Dietrich Bonhoeffer and his twin sister, Sabina, lay awake at night trying to imagine eternity. Their ritual eventually became a game as each child concentrated on the word, Ewigkeit to clear the mind of distractions. The first one asleep was declared the loser. Dietrich and Sabina, blue-eyed twins with flowing blonde hair, cleave to each other as the sixth and seventh children of Dr. Kral and Paula Bonhoeffer, no time more fiercely than their nocturnal peregrinations when they pondered the mysteries of life beyond death from the bed they shared. Dietrich almost always prevailed. On days when funerals were held at the Catholic Church, the twins watched from their bedroom window as cortages and black draped horses drawing the hearse approached the cemetery that lay in the meadow opposite their home. Avigkeit, eternity. Sabina found the word very long and gruesome Dietrich found it majestic and ravishing and endlessly fascinating. He called it an awesome, awesome word. 
Sometimes he pictured himself on his deathbed in the company of family and friends, reclining on the threshold of heaven, rising to his final utterance. He knew the lines he would speak. Sometimes he rehearsed them aloud to himself, though they had to be kept secret. He could not even tell Sabina. Death impressed itself on Dietrich as an enthralling mystery, and sometimes the uncanny notion became an obsession, ebullitions of, of awe. He might go to bed convinced that death would come that very night and transport him to eternity's vast mysterium. And some, in such times, he felt lightheaded, like the, the walls of the bedroom were reeling around like a carousel. The prospects of it happening now, that this night he would vanish into eternity, felt then so real he had to bite his tongue and induce pain. He needed reassurance that he still resided among the living. He wished to welcome death as an expected guest. He did not want to be taken by surprise. He was also convinced that he would die young. In the grip of these fierce fas fascinations, Dietrich worried that he suffered from an incurable disease. This was no ordinary illness and had no ordinary remedy. It was certainly not the kind of disease that his father, the noted neurologist and psychiatrist, treated. Sometimes it took the form of a waking nightmare. He imagined himself rushing from sister to brother, from parent to expert, pleading for help. Who could save him from this, this strange condition? After Dietrich and Sabina moved into separate bedrooms, the twins devised a code for keeping their nightly metaphysical routine. Dietrich drummed his fingers lightly against the wall in his admonitory knock, this is what he called it, announcing that the time had come to turn their minds heavenward. Each knock that followed signaled a ponderous thought, and the metaphysical exercise continued. But Dietrich usually discerned the final silence. Then the game ended, and he lay awake in the silent room. The only light came from a pair of crosses that his mother had placed atop a corner table. The crosses, illuminated by candles, whose light shielded him from darkness, were meant to bring comfort, and they usually did, though the shadows flickering against the walls took strange forms. When at night I go to bed, 14 angels round my stead, Paula Bonhoeffer sang reassuringly. Bonhoeffer liked the idea very much. He loved the idea of angels dressed in a little white cloak, standing by his bed at night, watching over him and children everywhere, bringing comfort, keeping them safe. The nightly ritual spared Dietrich the fate of being devoured by Satan, Sabina, the twin, later recalled, although, and perhaps for this reason, there are strikingly few references to Satan in his writings, early or late. Growing up in a humanistic family had, had, had steered Bonhoeffer clear of churchly lessons on damnation and hell and he carried none of the weight of the tormented pilgrim. Death enthralled more than it frightened, and the devil frightened him not at all. 
God does not want human beings to be afraid, he would later say in a sermon preached in an affluent London suburb. And grace, act two, Italy is simply irresistible. <laughs> That's Italy. Bonifer hatched his plan to visit Italy as he lay in bed recovering from a concussion. He had slipped while ice skating with friends on his 18th birthday. He now lived in Frau Jaeger's boarding house in the university town of Tübingen in one of the newer neighborhoods near the train station. Though confined to his rooms, he appeared in good spirits when his parents arrived from Berlin, bearing gifts of writing paper, tobacco, books, chocolate, and an envelope of 50 Deutsche Marks to buy anything he wanted. It was nice having his parents at his side and the large window of the boarding house at 10 Ulmstrasse offered a large uh, window uh, with views of the Rhine River in the distance. As far as the 50 Deutsche Mark Lanyard, Bonhoeffer had his sights set on the classical guitar he had seen in the Französische Viertel, the French qu uh, quarter of the town. Still, there was another infinitely better gift he had been uh, intending to ask his parents about, even better than the fine instrument with the wonderful tone. He wanted to spend the summer in Italy. Spending the summer in Italy, he said, would be the most fabulous thing that could happen to me. Going to Italy would be so fabulous, I can't even begin to imagine how fabulous it would be. His parents, who had made the grand tour themselves on numerous occasions, said yes and kindly set aside a generous sum to cover their son's travels. On Palm Sunday, 1924, Dietrich rose early, thrilled and expectant, and hurried to make the morning mass at St. Peter's Cathedral. He stood uh, next to a woman in the back who invited him to follow along in her Latin missal. The service was infused completely, he said, with the expectation of the passion, the reading of the liturgy in soft musical cadences, the confession of the creeds, the invocation of the Holy Spirit, by the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary. The tender and melodious sounds of the people, the music and spoken word, enveloped the vast enclosures beneath the light-filled vault. And Bonhoeffer, propelled, excited by this veritable feast of rich ecclesial offerings, was seized suddenly by the notion, which he wrote down in his day book, the universality of the church. <laughs> the benediction left him wanting more. So after lunch, he walked to the uh, Chiesa of the Gesù, the magnificent church near the Palazzo Atieri, which housed the crypt of St. Ignatius of Loyola. Bonhoeffer marveled at the multitude of white-robed Jesuits shimmering like a sea of flowers as they read passages from Lamentations. Large families waited their turn at the confessionals, illuminated by slowly darkening altar candles. Bonhoeffer, a freshman theology student back in Germany, marveled at it all. Then to Vespers at Trinité de Monte, where 40 girls in a solemn procession wearing nuns' habits with blue or green sashes, took vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. The girls sang Evensong, Bonhoeffer wrote, with unbelievable simplicity, grace, and great seriousness. Every trace of routine was missing, and the whole thing gave me an unparalleled impression 
a profound, sincere piety. It was worship in the true sense. After Vespers, standing outside on the terrace above the Spanish steps, Bonhoeffer savored the most magnificent view of the eternal city, the sky bathed in the red light of the sunset. On Good Friday, he was back at St. Peter's, among the first to arrive for the early service, where another ecclesial feast had been abundantly prepared. The mellifluous gospel reading, the magnificent singing and choral response, the extraordinary festive adoration of the cross before which the priest knelt, kissing the cross, adorning it. It was exciting now for Bonhoeffer to follow the Mass in his own missal, the gift of a Catholic seminarian he had met by the name of Plata Platinius. Bonhoeffer noted excitedly in his day book, the Christus Factus, the Benedictus from St. Luke's Gospel, and once again, the Miserere, the beautiful penitential prayer in Psalm 51, Lord, have mercy upon us. Bonhoeffer registered not a hint of Protestant discomfort when a doughy-faced castrati ascended from the choir and sang three solos for the alto. In fact, the effect was quite the opposite. The eunuch song, Bonhoeffer said, while thoroughly inhuman, produced a peculiar, rapturous ecstasy. Bonhoeffer held his missile close to him, delighted in its strange glories. For the most part, the texts are wonderfully poetic and lucid. He wrote, everything flows from the main theme of the Mass, the sacrificial death, and its continual reenactment in the sacrificial Mass of communion. Later, that same evening, Bonhoeffer engaged in a rare theological debate. Amidst the exhilarating pageantry of Holy Week, he had had little time or interest in arguing about doctrine. And now he served up only a few fleeting defenses of his evangelical faith, and it was only by the prodding of Plata Platenius that Bonhoeffer briefly turned his attention away from the magnificent and worshipful Roman frolic to formulate a Protestant notion or two. Plata Platinius told Bonhoeffer that modern Catholicism remained fundamentally the same as early Christianity and that the creeds and councils of the magisterium clarified and made intelligent the essence of the faith. Bonhoeffer took Plata Platinius's bait and the two students debated the point as they traversed the crowded city streets. Bonhoeffer countered with the prospect that Catholicism falsified the original and turned the effervescence of Christianity into static dogma. Protestantism enabled the symbolic and doctrinal encrustations of Christianity to fall away, which was a more honest approach. But that was as far as the conversation went. Bonhoeffer had nothing more to say. He was too busy trying to make the next Roman mass and the churches that Martin Luther had centuries earlier called the synagogues of Satan. The 17-year-old Berlin prodigy journeyed through Rome in a state of perpetual bliss. America, 1930-31, Act 3. At the end of the fall semester, as the end of the fall semester grew near and Advent approached, Bonhoeffer found it surprisingly difficult to get into the spirit of the season. He had never spent Christmas apart from his family. And memories of family happiness and all the gatherings and festivities that his mother planned with such great, grand, uh, great fanfare left him in a downhearted mood. 
But homesickness did not account for the sum of his feelings. He wrote to a friend back in Germany to say that his hope of finding in America a cloud of witnesses had been utterly disappointed. He had written in a journal that he hoped in this year, as a student abroad, to find a greater cloud of witnesses, some kind of a concrete embodiment of Christ and community that he had tasted and glimpsed in Rome, but never really experienced in the melancholy of the North Protestant German plains. One feels like one is standing on an observation tower, looking out over the whole world. And no matter where one looks, most of what one sees is infinitely depressing. The frivolous attitudes of the mainline churches in America had proved vexing from the start. But now Bonhoeffer took the hollowness of Protestant liberalism as a kind of mirror into his own soul. Monday morning editions of the New York Times with their page three summaries of sermons preached the previous day read to him like dispatches from a spiritual wasteland with headlines conveying a Protestant ethos desperately seeking relevance. Jesus is better without the creeds. The five pillars of a healthy personality. Pastor urges strong values in the home. Bonhoeffer read these titles and wrote to a friend, in New York, they preach about virtually everything except Jesus. So thank God Christmas is coming. Otherwise, I would fall completely into despair. And he was still three months away from another Good Friday service, 1931, when he ambled into the sanctuary of St. Mark's in the Bowery for a service that featured the hipster priest, William Norman Guthrie, unpacking the seven last words of Christ and a recitation inspired by Ezra Pound's cantos. This gave parishioners, Guthrie, the pastor, claimed a more convincing revelation of the heroic son of man. Having once been temporarily relieved of his ecclesial ministrations after staging a church dance to an Egyptian sun god, Parson Guthrie took the occasion of Good Friday to reject the cross of Christ. I don't want that kind of God. I deny the reconciliation of the cross. And instead, he treated his flock to a smorgasbord of syncretistic samplings, a Brahmin priest performing Hindu prayers, a chanting Mohawk Indian in full body paint, a Zoroastrian holy man laboring over a fire ceremony, and a barefoot dance troupe from Barnard College improvising an Annunciation Day sketch. A ray of light came the next week when Bonhoeffer, with a little money and a tent and a quartet of unlikely companions, sputtered out of New York City in a third-hand Oldsmobile. May 5th, 1931. Spring was now in full bloom, and an hour outside the city, the open road cut through the rolling hills of Essex County, shimmering with the early wildflowers. Bonifer sat behind the wheel, with flanked by a Swiss fella, a Frenchman, and an American Paul Lehman who would go as far as Chicago. Roadway options were limited in 1931, but even with only a smattering of postcards as clues uh, uh, to their route, the men likely caught Highway 22 West in Newark and then drove through Reading, Harrisonburg, Altoona, and Pittsburgh. And a postcard marked Portland 
a hamlet in the heart of the Slate Belt, Bonhoeffer wrote, after driving the first 100 miles in three hours with very little traffic, we have arrived in the mountains of Pennsylvania. We're eating lunch and enjoying the beautiful surroundings and this beautiful warm weather. From there, Highway 30 cut west, uh, the straightest route to Akron, Fort Wayne, Gary, and Chicago. And then it was the long, lonesome Highway 51, south through Springfield, St. Louis, Memphis, Jackson, Hammond, all the way to New Orleans, with only Bonhoeffer and Lasserre, the Frenchman, holding proper driver's license and able to sit behind the wheel. Bonhoeffer successfully navigated the streets of the Crescent City, deposited the Swiss fellow off at the harbor where he had made arrangements to take a ship back to New York City. And now the quartet had become a fellowship of two. Vast distances still lay ahead. A color postcard of a longhorn bull on May 16th informed his grandmother, Julie, that the hill country of South Central Texas called to mind the mountains of the uh, Eastern Herz, where the Bonhoeffer family had a beautiful country home. It was fresh, untouched, beautiful, beautiful country. On May 17th, Bonhoeffer wrote from the border town of Laredo to say that he had never felt anything like the soupy furnace of South Texas heat, where the temperatures had already swelled into the mid-90s and only half past May. But everything was going great. The car ran smoothly over well-built roads, and after sunset, the huge prairie sky glowed like candles for nearly an hour. And there at the border, Bonhoeffer and Lasserre hopped on a train from Mexico City. And for a week, they explored the mysteries of Mexico's strange intermediate culture with its Spanish Catholic and native Indian elements to curiously, so curiously and provocatively combined. At the invitation of a Quaker friend of Lasserre's, the two Europeans, Dietrich and Jean, shared their observations of the New World at a gathering in Mexico. And it pleased Lasserre to hear Dietrich speak of his new understanding of the Sermon on the Mount and Jesus' commandments on peace. The example of peace, it seems, had been the example of Christ it seems, had been discussed over long hours on the road and under night skies at campsites. Peppered throughout Lasserre's um, disputations were such extraordinary, astonishing ideas as the seductions and treacheries of the war god Mars, the subversive power of Christ's nonviolent weakness, the limits of obedience to the nation. Bonhoeffer had mounted strong counter-arguments from the German war tradition in the southern latitudes. Bonhoeffer was beginning to learn the language of peace. The two men drove 12, 14, 16 hour days, interrupted only by clumsy attempts to cook meat over campfires frantic and often futile searches for a motel room when in need of hot shower and a bed, and occasional misadventures of roughing it in the wild. On the return trip to New York, the two men retraced their steps to New Orleans, but then took a different road the rest of the way home, following Highway 20 into the heart of the Jim Crow South Crossing the border into Mississippi, the road brought them through Hattiesburg, Laurel, Meridian, Demopolis, Tuscaloosa. In Birmingham, they moved onto Highway 11 towards Knoxville, passing the exit to the North Alabama town of Scottsboro. The same month, nine young black men were accused of raping two white women on a freight train and in a terrible miscarriage of justice, were convicted in a mob atmosphere and successive trials. 
then unto Roanoke, Stanton, Harrisonburg, through Hagerstown, West Virginia, Harrisburg, PA, unto Highway 22 east to Reading and Newark, and finally back to New York City. 4,000 miles in seven weeks in a car, another 1,200 on Mexican trains. Although Bonhoeffer kept no journal on the trip, he was driving the entire time, or most of the time, it seems likely he made notes along the way. In any case, impressions of the journey through the South, built around studied observations of race relations, appeared in his final report on that exchange year in the summer of 1931, with arresting power sometimes. Terse phrases evoke the ordeals of Jim Crow, blood laws, mob rules, sterilizations, land seizures, a world darker than a thousand midnights. Bonhoeffer had observed incidents of racism in New York City. Once while waiting for a table at a Manhattan diner, he and a black uh, friend, Frank Fisher, had been rudely shooed off by the owner. But Bonhoeffer wrote, the way the Southerners talk about the Negroes is simply repugnant. And the pastors, they're no better than the others. The report reveals, too, that on a Sunday morning in May, with visceral and unforgettable effect, Bonifer stopped somewhere east of New Orleans and south of Knoxville and worshiped in a black rural church. Charged, he wrote, with an enormous intensity of feeling and embraced by outcries and interrupting shouts, he said he heard the gospel preached with conviction and power for the first time in the United States in the black churches. Here, one really could hear someone talk about sin and grace and love and ultimate hope. And beyond the preaching, he felt church deep in his bones, in the spirituals, in the strange mixture of reserved melancholy, in the eruptive joy of Negro worship. It was as if these black Christians, through enormous intensity and feeling, had tapped into the source of the romantic's longing for sublimity, but out of the great spiritual genius had earthed emotion, intensity, and feeling in the sorrowful joy of Jesus of Nazareth. Bonifer said he awakened to fresh spiritual energies in the American church of the outcast. The Baptist in me just wants to say amen at that point. Thank you. What we shall need is a new monasticism, Act 4. <laughs> in a letter to his older brother, Carl Friedrich, in the spring of 1935, Bonhoeffer tried to explain to this brother he admired, a brilliant physicist, uh, a human rights champion, and an atheist, why he followed Jesus Christ. Like Dietrich, Karl Friedrich opposed the Nazis, and he, he championed it, it that year, um, human rights causes with, with a kind of ferocity that, that his younger brother did not even share. But he did not share Dietrich's convictions or understand his decision to become a theologian and pastor. When he first heard Bonhoeffer say this, years earlier, he promptly announced you will be living your life in full intellectual retreat from everything important. <laughs> Bonifer told his brother, perhaps I seem to you rather fanatical. <laughs> I myself am sometimes afraid of that. But I know that the day I become more reasonable, to be honest, I should have to chuck so much of my of my theology. You see, when I first started in theology, my idea of it was quite different. It was rather more academic. 
But now it's turned into something else altogether. And I do believe that at last I'm on the right track for the first time in my life. I often feel so happy about it. I only worry about being so afraid of what other people will think as to get bogged down instead of going forward. But I think I am right in saying that I would only achieve true inner clarity and honesty by really starting to take the Sermon on the Mount seriously. Here alone lies the force that can blow all this Nazi hocus-pocus sky-high like fireworks, leaving only a few burnt-out shells behind. But you know, the restoration of the church must surely depend on something different, on a new kind of monasticism, which has little in common with the old, but is a life of uncompromising discipleship. I believe the time has come to gather people together and to do this. A few months later, Bonhoeffer arrived at a windswept town on the Baltic Sea to incarnate his experiment in new monasticism. He had spent holidays near the Baltic with his family and later as a college student trekked with classmates through Lübeck, Timmendorf, Plun, and the trails of Dittmarschen where the land was, was flat and verdant. But warm days are a rarity on European's northern coast, as you know, if you've been there, and a clear June morning can suddenly turn to gray shoots of rain and bracing winds. And by summer's end, the huts that formed the community, warmed by the sun, became uninhabitable. So Bonhoeffer jumped when a former estate in um, the P P Pomerania region became available, 30 well-tended acres uh, of land with classrooms and reliable heating. And there in the town of Finkenwalde, now Poland, in Poland, the first session of the Preacher's Seminary in Finkenwalde began on August 26, 1935. This is the subject of his book, Life Together. For the students who had never heard Bonhoeffer lecture, and even for many who had known him at Berlin University, the classes were unlike anything they had ever encountered. Students soon realized they were not there simply to learn new techniques of preaching and instruction, but were initiates into a new manner of being a Christian. Dissent, resistance, these must be nourished by spiritual sources, prayer, Bible study, concentration on the essential matters, expanded the moral imagination. On a more personal level, Bonhoeffer's insatiable hunger for intimate brotherhood had brought him to this beautiful trace of land and upper Pomerania and community for these two years became his artwork, beauty and discipline forming a perfect circle. Still, Bonhoeffer may be the only monk ever described by his brothers as a dappy dresser. The seminarian's first afternoon together had been a festive affair. The day was bright and clear, and the promise of a new semester excited the conversations. As students gathered on the lawn for an opening day reception, a young uh, country boy, son of a pastor named Eberhard Beitke, asked one of his new classmates when Pastor Bonhoeffer was expected to arrive. The student smiled and nodded in the direction of a tan, blonde-haired fellow in a white suit. That's Bonhoeffer, the dapper dresser. <laughs> Bonhoeffer, at age 29, with only three, uh, was only three years older than Eberhard, but he looked younger. Eberhard introduced himself to Dietrich, and the two men spoke briefly, sipping white wine on the summer lawn. 
Within a few weeks, they had become inseparable. Bonhoeffer would soon refer to Eberhard as my daring, trusting spirit. While Bonhoeffer and other friends might spend time together discussing theological matters, politics, the church struggle, the Kirchenkampf, things were different with Eberhard. With Eberhard, he entered into a friendship unlike any he had ever known. In an autobiographical novel that remained unfinished, Bonhoeffer described the camaraderie of two men, Christoph and Ulrich, two men who had come to know each other down to the most minute detail of their behavior, opinions, and innate characteristics. Two men who, as two persons, had grown together into an intimate union. Some seminarians wondered whether Bonhoeffer had fallen in love with this young country pastor with a boyish smile. In fact, Bonhoeffer's affection for Baker would at times become a source of resentment among the brethren. Baker, some complained, had become the Ausgesprochene Liebling des Chefs, the chef's clear favorite, his dear one. Sensitivity to these feelings was perhaps one reason Bonhoeffer insisted that no one was to speak about a fellow ordinant in his absence, or if this should happen, to tell him about it afterwards. In the music room of the rambling estate that housed this illegal seminary of the confessing church, this experiment in new monasticism, Bonhoeffer played piano while Eberhard sang in a delicate tenor. Dietrich taught Eberhard, a son of the manse, to love Chopin and Brahms. Eberhard inspired Bonhoeffer, a child of the Bildungsbürgertum, the educated upper middle class, to an appreciation of choral music of the Reformation. At the end of the, of the first session, Bonhoeffer told his family that this time had been, without a doubt, the most joyful period of his life. But it had not been easy, this experiment in new monasticism, or for that matter, successful, at least from the perspective of the other members of the community. Equipped with little personal experience of ascetical living, Bonhoeffer's plan for raising up a generation of radical Christians formed by the pure gospel produced fairly dismal results in the early going. Besides the ever loyal Eberhard, few seminarians um, uh, found the strict liturgical ordina- uh, ordering of their day to their liking. There was too much must for us, one student complained. Gerhard Abeling, a Finkenwalde student who later became a theologian, complained of the, of the oppressively Jesuitical air of the school. Others expressed frustration and disappointment. They had come in search of knowledge and answers, but all they had received was, uh, for their efforts was, was a sense of emptiness and failure in themselves and in their reading of scripture. Take, for example, one ordinance said to Bonhoeffer, the, the morning period of quiet meditation, which Bonhoeffer required. It seemed interminable. Protestants are supposed to be people of the word, okay, but a full half hour of silent meditation is torture. The mind moves around, memories flicker into consciousness, dreams awaken, angers flare up. Bonhoeffer listened to the criticisms and he made a few repairs. On the problem of drifting thoughts, he invited the pastors in training to accept distraction. And these distractions is a natural part of the devotional life, not to fret, not to fall into the paralyzing trap of of hyper self-monitoring, distractions, reverie, daydreaming, 
Fold them into your prayer. Don't try to fight them off. That's a losing battle anyway. Everything's going to come out in the open eventually. Well, therefore, not only allowed a logistical change, welcoming these open discussions in his exercise in new monasticism, he also told the men that they would no longer be expected to, uh, to meditate alone. They could form contemplative pairs or clusters and share solitude. The discipline of silence, however, Bonhoeffer emphasized, must be learned. It must be practiced, even if in pairs or in clusters, because teaching about Christ always begins and silence. Christian thinking and acting emerge from encounter with Jesus in stillness before the word. Yes, there is a silence we must learn. And this is the silence that brings clarification, purification, and concentration upon the essential thing, holy silence is the heart's hidden center, a concentrated attention to joy and freshness that awakens and makes strange once again the mysteries of the word. So, the final act, act five, the final feast in the next cell, a prisoner wept aloud. Early the next morning, a slot in the door scratched open and a tiny portion of bread appeared on a tin plate. The prison staff addressed Bonifer and the men as scoundrels, scum, traitors, fine. It was six months before Bonifer received any warrant uh, for his arrest. Sometime toward the end of the first week, he was moved to an isolation cell on the top floor of the Gestapo prison. He was not allowed books, newspapers, and tobacco, or to write letters. Bonhoeffer remained in solitary confinement for the next 12 days shackled hand and foot. The cell door opened only to bring food or remove the latrine bucket. Otherwise, the prison staff made him invisible, refusing to answer questions or reciprocate any spoken word. He wasn't permitted the regular half hour of free time in the prison yard. He lay in his cot, unable to sleep. And of course, at night, uh, night times carry the muffled sobs of men broken by the long periods of solitary confinement. Prison is the habitation of every dismal sound Bonhoeffer had marked long ago in his worn copy of Don Quixote. This was his new congregation. During the two years that separate his arrest and his death, Bonhoeffer took stock of his life and all its um, variety in letters, poems, prayers, drafts of short stories, unfinished novels, plays, and, and uh, outlines of future books and essays, and aphorisms, and exegeses, and music sketches, and sketches on various other themes. The letters and papers from prison are, are fragments of a, of a great unburdening, howls against sanguine hopes. Bonhoeffer resisted the notion that he suffered in prison. To suggest that he was suffering, as some friends did, felt like a profanation to him. He shared his, his private fears eventually in, in correspondence with Eberhard, he said the first weeks had been wretched, sure. Still, it would be a perverse indulgence to say that he suffered, and he had no hankering after martyrdom. These things must not be dramatized, he cautioned. A great deal is horrible here. Yeah, but where is it otherwise? 
the Jews suffered. The families of the fallen brethren suffered. The mental incompetence murdered by killing squads had suffered. His anxious parents suffered. Now, suffering must be something quite different, must have a different dimension from what I have so far experienced. On his wall of a cell, he hung a reproduction of Duro's Apocalypse, a rendering of Revelation 12:7, the battle between good and evil, and St. Michael leading the angels against the dragon. Bonhoeffer placed a bouquet of primroses on a table made of cast iron. In prison, he forged new directions of thought, like an artist making repeated brushstrokes on a densely layered canvas, and he returned to many of his first loves. He recalled his student years and his convivial exchanges with professors Harnack and Hall, his feelings for the vanished ideals of, of, of German humanism grew tender and nostalgic. A decade had passed since he had been a full-time member of the university. One of his last seminars in the summer of 1933 had been a line-by-line -line reading of Hegel's lectures on the philosophy of religion. He found nourishment in the great scholarly tradition of the 19th century, which had earlier produced profound heaviness. Protective boundaries collapsed gently in these months in her greater awakening to what he called the polyphony of life. He spoke of loss and letting go, of academic careers left unfulfilled, of engagements left pending, letters unfinished. He might easily have joined ranks with those who were torn into fragments by events and by questions. Instead, he opened himself to the incompleteness of things, accepted the upheavals and intrusions with a disarming gratefulness. God was the great story that enfolded all of fragmented reality into an everlasting song. God so loved the world that he gave. And Bonhoeffer said, that which is fragmentary may even point to a higher fulfillment which can no longer be achieved by human effort. Filled with gratitude for a wholeness he had once known, Bonhoeffer turned to the small and sometimes broken things, not resolutely but compassionately. A stanza that I came across from Storm resonates with this mood and echoes over and over in my consciousness like a melody I can't get out of my mind. If outside it's all gone mad and in Christian ways or not, still is the world, this gorgeous world, entirely resilient. A few colorful fall flowers outside the cell window, a half hour's exercise in the prison yard at last, the sight of a beautiful linden tree, minor glories suffice to confirm the whole. In the end, he said, the world is summed up in a few people one wants to see and with whom one wishes to be together. In prison, Bonhoeffer sang a song of earthly love. No transcendent hiddenness or gazing into the endless distance. He said he did not share Diogenes' opinion that the absence of desire is the highest joy and an empty barrel the ideal vessel. The song of Solomon, Bonhoeffer discovered to his infinite delight, the Hebrew Bible's love song to sensual love, consecrated the flesh in all the right places. You really can't imagine a hotter, more sensual, and more glowing love than the one spoken of here, he wrote. Bonhoeffer questioned the judgment of anyone who would say that the restraint of passion 
capture the disciples' prerogative. Where is there such restraint in the Old Testament, he wrote. Israel is delivered out of Egypt so that it may live before God as God's people on earth in all their sinfulness. Shut inside a Gestapo prison, there was little more Bonhoeffer could do for the Jews of Europe now than to honor the story of Israel as a lesson to the Christian church. Bonhoeffer was a man formed in single-minded discipleship to Jesus who realized that precisely for this reason, thinking about God would forever wander into abstraction and idolatry if it were not anchored in the history, suffering, and religion of the Jews. In October 1944, Bonhoeffer had been transferred from Tegel Prison to the brutal um, Gestapo Nazi prison at Prince Albrechtstrasse. The city of Berlin lay in ruins and smoke filled the city. Whole streets, uh, uh, whole streets had disappeared under piles of cascading rubble and broker, broken water lines created vast sheets of, of black ice. He penned a prelude to eternity, a poem, Von Guten Mächten, an epistolary last statement with, a, with an embedded poetic jewel, wrote Bonhoeffer's translator. By all good powers, but still it's a poem that breathes mortal longings. Those surrounded by faithful, quiet powers of good, so wondrously consoled and sheltered here in the prison cell, how fine it would be still to enter the new year with family and friends, to the joys of this world and its glorious sun. If it is possible, do reunite us he says. But Bonhoeffer understands the situation. He has been condemned to die as a traitor. And memory gives way in the poem to expectation. And the voices of the past fade to the deepest quiet. He no longer hears them. But against the narrowing horizon of death, on the threshold of time and eternity, he begins to hear a new song. Oh, let our ears, now that fullest sound amaze of this, your world, God, invisibly expanding as all your children sing high hymns of praise. How could this feel? What should this be? This past becoming present once again, pure, free, and whole, becoming your life's enduring part. And in that expanding chorus. The past returned as a source of comfort. The woodland scenes and the quiet glades from his country home in Friedrichsbrunn, the stars glistening in the Pomeranian sky, breezes purring through the linden forest, the enchanting days of early autumn, the absence of sermons and family and choral song, however, no longer filled him with longing and sadness. The wind bears fragments of hymns to me. In the hell of the Gasapo interrogation prison, Bonhoeffer 
was graced with the visitation of angels. And the great invisible realm had become visible. And there was no longer any doubt about its existence. Everywhere resounded in this new song the yes and the amen. Two weeks later, in a letter to his parents, handwritten in pencil, he turned to the matter of his personal effects. What should he do with his wardrobe? He asked his mother to give it away as a people's offering. His dinner jacket, his felt hats, his salt and pepper suit, which was too small anyway, you noted, his pair of brown loafers, his fur. He was confident that his dear mama would have a better idea by now than he of what he still owned. In short, give it all away, whatever anyone might need without giving it a second thought. The famous last words attributed to Bonhoeffer, spoken in the hour of his death, this is not the end for me, it is the beginning of a life, came from a report written later by a British intelligence officer after the war. Bonhoeffer's last written words, I think, offer a more fitting tribute to this theologian and pastor. Mom, please drop off some stationery with the commissar. Thanks. So thank you so much, and um, we have 10 or 15 minutes uh, for questions and answers. I would love to hear what's on your mind, whether any thoughts or questions about Bonhoeffer and Five Acts or um, other questions pertaining to this story that you might want to ask. So please, um, uh, to ask a question, do come over and stand in front of the microphone. It's important that you do that so it can be recorded for posterity. And uh, I'll be happy to uh, engage you in any way. I thank you for your wonderful tour through Bonhoeffer. Um, it's from my understanding uh, and my own experience, younger seminary students and theologians tend to be uh, quite impressed with the letters and papers in prison because of uh, some of the things that Bonhoeffer would talk about, uh, Jesus pushed out of the world on the cross, um, etc. cetera. Um, and uh, from my understanding, Bart uh, encouraged people not to make too much of what Bonhoeffer said in prison. And I was asking maybe to clarify maybe what you know Bart's position was on that and how to respond to that, if we should take more seriously what Bonhoeffer wrote in prison or not. Yeah, we should take more seriously what Bonhoeffer wrote. Do you, some, some of you have read Letters and Papers from Prison. How many of you are familiar with that book? It's an extraordinary book um, that's now available in a scholarly edition through this fabulous um, series of um, the Bonhoeffer works. And it's remarkable um, that Bonhoeffer was 39 when he died. Okay, he stopped teaching at the university in 1933, taught at the seminary that I mentioned in the third act. Um, but much of his writing was done, you know, literally in planes, trains, and automobiles, and in these various retreats and uh, um, monasteries and, and um, estates that, that he um, went to for periods of, of reflection. Yet his uh, entire corpus um, comes to 16 volumes. So, and some of these volumes are a thousand pages long. I mean, it's an extraordinary, um, it's an extraordinary achievement. 
Um, and so there's so much about Bonhoeffer we, we simply don't know. Um, I, I, I think Letters and Papers from Prison is um, really one of the most exciting theological texts of the 20th century. Karl Barth didn't like it very much because Bonhoeffer criticizes uh, Barth throughout Letters and Papers from Prison. I mean, Barth, Bonhoeffer always imagined himself to be a, a kind of Barthian. Um, uh, Bonhoeffer was trained in a Protestant liberal faculty in Berlin um, that really um, was suspicious about the new movement that Bart led, the kind of dialectical theology movement. Um, Bart, when Bonhoeffer first read Bart, he read Bart's little book, The Word of God and the Word of Man, which is an amazing book, and then the, uh, the commentary on the epistles to the Romans, it just blew his mind. I mean, you can all think of books that you may have read somewhere in your intellectual journey, which is like, after you read that, you can never think about the subject matter the same. And, um, and, and so, you know, Bonhoeffer's um, first dissertation has a couple of references to Bart, uh, but then the second dissertation, you know, two doctorates by the time he's 23 years old, um, you know, he has, and he has begun to kind of uh, imbibe the, the Bartian movement, but he was always a, a bit of an outsider uh, and never considered himself a convert uh, um, or, a, or a disciple of Bart. And they had a very interesting and, uh, relationship over, uh, over several, two decades. Um, but in the letters and papers from prison, uh, Bonifer says, that he, he, he had started to worry about the direction Bon uh, Bart had taken in, um, in the church dogmatics to one, uh, and characterized uh, uh, Bart's new approach as, okay, here is the system of church doctrine that is faithful to uh, scripture and tradition, like it or, you know, leave it. And, um, and, and Bonhoeffer sort of riffs on that for a while. He also says that there's something about the, the way that, that, that Bart characterized revelation, not only early on, you know, revelation as event, decision, act, you know, this kind of uh, infinite qualitative distinction of the holy other crashing into time in Jesus Christ, but even throughout the dogmatics that seemed to be slightly suffocating. <laughs> that it seemed to have an effect on um, the, it seemed to, um, it seemed to conclude, let me put it differently, that, that he, he sort of, Bonhoeffer attributed to Bart a kind of ecclesial monism that suffocated worldliness and the integrity of individual human experience. And Bart, that just made Bart crazy when he read this later, and he wouldn't let you know, students write dissertations on, on, on Bonhoeffer until John Godsey's dissertation in, in, in the 50s. Um, so it's a, it's a very interesting um, dialogue, but the letters and papers from prison is just mind-blowing. I mean, one of, the last, one of the last documents Bonhoeffer writes is called An Outline for a Book. And in this little outline, it's only three pages long, he is in a prison and he's surveying the ruins of the church, okay? He is looking out at the German Christian church, which had wholeheartedly embraced the Nazi regime as the will of God for the German nation, as indeed the consummation of their Germanic spirit. And he's looking at this church that is in ruins, that is completely um, uh, compromised and profaned its witness and he says, what do we do? What do we do next? Where do we go from here? How, how, how do we begin to talk about God and Jesus Christ in the language of the faith at a time when the language of faith has been subject to a million equivocations, when it's been dragged into, you know, various little schemes for, you know, justifying the Nazi way of life, or justifying racial superiority, or justifying Aryan family values, or whatever the case may be. What do you do? How do you begin anew? Um, it's extraordinary. And he said, well, what about the church? You know, what, what should the church do in this time? And some of his proposals are, 
Intriguing, moving, shocking. The church must give away everything. Give away all its money. The pastor should stop working full-time and they should work in the, in the world and then, you know, have, uh, have their callings as a, a, a lift out in secular life, but, you know, preach sort of in kind of surreptitious ways. <laughs> the church must identify fully with the suffering. The church must become a church of the outcast. I mean, all of these ponderous notions, there's no... Um, there's, 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 there, there are no final resolutions to those questions he's asking. But those questions he's asking in the letters and papers from prison, imagine sitting at this point in time in history, looking at a church that has compromised its gospel, wondering, where do we go from here? What do we do as people of faith when the gospel that we proclaim sounds to most people like simply another way of describing Nazi family values, or the German way of life, or the American way of life. And so these are questions that we must wrestle with, sorry, for such a long response. When did you first become interested in Bonhoeffer, and uh, what about him or his writings interested you the most? Yeah, well, that's, thank you um, for that. Um, question. Well, you know, I, I grew up in a minister's family. Any minister's kids here tonight? Yeah. We should just all go out tonight and, like, have a support, support group session or something. Um, yeah, I grew up a ba Southern Baptist minister's kid, and, um, and I grew up in the Deep South, came of age in a small town in Mississippi, um, that was, in fact, the epicenter of Southern terrorism. Um, and I, you know, I heard Bonhoeffer mentioned in the sermon, in sermons, like you did, uh, the great martyr, um, passages from Cost of Discipleship, when Jesus bids a person follow him, Jesus bids that person to come and die. Will someone remind me to say something about that passage uh, after I answer your question? I had not really read uh, much more uh, than that, and um, went on to um, college, grad school. I was doing a PhD in philosophical theology, and particularly kind of theory-saturated department in the mid-'80s, when everybody was talking about deconstructing this, and logocentrism, and whatever, and post-structuralism, and all that was in the air. It was very thick in the air at my school. and. Um, increasingly, it felt to me suffocating. And while I was, you know, taking reading courses in Hegel and Kant and um, Fichte and Feuerbach and Derrida and Heidegger, those people, I was also desperately looking for a way out, a way back to life, a way from the phraseological, if you will, to the real. That's a Bonhoeffer phrase. And um, so I, I came to Bonhoeffer actually at the stage of my doctoral dissertation um, a, as a liberation. Um, Bonhoeffer had read the same canon of literature that I had read. And yet in his early writings, which most of us haven't read, most of we haven't had access to, Sanctorum Communio Act and Being, he talks about how this, this kind of philosophical tradition reaches an impasse and becomes um, really a way of, of, of constructing a world-dominating ego or a world-constitutive subject. And it's only, Bonhoeffer said, through the encounter of God and Jesus Christ and the tr breaking in of God and time that the, that the heart turned in on itself the self-imprisoned consciousness of the transcendental tradition can be exposed to new light, to difference, to real otherness. <laughs> and so bon you know, Bonhoeffer was, offered me the conceptual and philosophical and theological tools to kind of make this journey from very abstract philosophical theology to, well, 
lived theology, I suppose, or as someone said not too long ago when introducing me, livid theology, I kind of like that, um, better. But now I'm finishing a biography, and um, Lord, if I ever write another biography or start writing another biography, just shoot me. You know, I thought that five years ago when I, um, I'd finished a trilogy of books on the civil rights movement and a, a little book on um, a, a little a theological meditation on American Christianity during the uh, presidency of George W. Bush called Wayward Christian Soldiers. And then I wrote a little book with John Perkins. Some of you may know John Perkins, who's one of my dear friends from Mississippi. Um, I signed up for a little book about Bonhoeffer in America. This is going to be about this one year Bonhoeffer came to America. And then one thing led to another, and it began to be clear to me that it had to be a cradle-to-grave account. Um, and so for about three and a half years, this is what I've been doing. I have been trying to offer a new retelling of Bonhoeffer's story using all these extraordinary new materials and documents so that, you know, we have some understanding of who he was as a character, who he was as a person. Um, something about his interiority is, you know, develop him, you know, on a, on a narrative scale as a character. You can sit down, please. In Cost of Discipleship. You know, Cost of Discipleship is probably his most popular book. And it's a wonderful book. It's a very hard and austere and severe book. It's a, it's a book that offers discipleship as an all or nothing proposition. It's a book that says, um, as Bonhoeffer was saying at, those time, at that time, if you are not in the confessing church, that is the church, this one little body of the German church that was resisting Hitler, then you are not in salvation. <laughs> It was a clear drawing of the lines that unless you are willing to take that first step into the new world of Jesus, you are in some fashion um, exemplifying cheap grace. Cheap grace is grace that says, thanks God, it's an awesome thing that, you, that you've saved me and that you've re re redeemed me and that you've forgiven me of my sins. And now, let's just go party and, you know, let's go do anything and let's just, you know, in, indulge our salvation because, you know, it's done. It's over. There's nothing I can do. Um, costly grace reckons with the um, inescapable proposition that discipleship without obedience is a false religion. Okay, this is a very harsh book. He who um, call, uh, Jesus calls, he calls to um, come and die. It really disturbed some of the uh, fellow students of the Sphinkenwalde Seminary later to learn that Bonhoeffer had in prison had second thoughts about discipleship, about the cost of discipleship. That he had, in a letter to Eberhard, say, you know, I, I, I just would not want to write that book today. And when I think back um, to the experience of writing the cost of uh, discipleship, I understand why in that particular time, when the church is singing Hosanna to Hitler, and people in the pews believe that by being a good German citizen, they are fulfilling the you know, requirements of the prophets and of Jesus Christ, that it was, that it was necessary to present people with this all or nothing proposition, but I would not say that now. In fact, I now think of the cost of discipleship as a stage in the journey uh, of my relationship with Christ. And it really bothered 
uh, some of the Finkenwalder brothers to learn that Bonhoeffer, while he stood behind Cost of Discipleship as an important book for its time, understood it as a very contextualized book that shouldn't be pulled out and said and, and presented as a normative account of Christian discipleship that it lacked balance, it lacked texture, it lacked a grounding in the church, it la lacked a grounding in uh, Israel, it lacked a, a, a really profound, uh, any kind of understanding of sanctification, it, it lacked um, a nature and beauty and passion and bodiliness, it lacked so many things. So, an interesting point that came late that I wanted you to know. Um, we have another two or three minutes. One more. One more question. Thank you, Dr. Marsh. Yes. Uh, it, it seems to me that Bonhoeffer is, is well-loved um, both by mainstream and liberal Protestants on the one hand and also by uh, more conservative evangelical Protestants on the other. First, why, why do you think that is? And secondly, what, um, what is there in Bonhoeffer's life uh, or his theology um, that could be tilled to bring greater unity to those sort of wings of the church? That's a great question. And, you know, it's um, interesting to be discussing Bonhoeffer at this time after um, the biography by Eric Metaxas had uh, kind of just exploded onto the scenes in the spring of 2010. And suddenly, you know, uh, uh, who is not Bill O'Reilly, but the other, Glenn Beck is, you know, having these forums on Bonhoeffer, and I'm like, am I hallucinating? I mean, what is this? Um, so it's a really interesting question. I mean, uh, Bonhoeffer is always, I mean, an, an interesting sort of quick example of this is just, you know, an, the, an annual meeting of an of a international Dietrich Bonhoeffer Society, and it sounds like the most boring thing in the world, but in fact, and maybe this sounds really pathetic, but my wife and I celebrated our 30th wedding anniversary this past summer and went to um, a Bonhoeffer Society meeting. It was in Stockholm, Sweden, okay? So that was kind of cool. And I skipped almost every session. Um, but, um, and then and we went to Copenhagen and other places and had a great time. But at these meetings, um, uh, you know, one really has a profound sense of the ecumenical church. There are, um, there are evangelicals um, from, you know, around the world. There are Pentecostals, there are Roman Catholics, there are um, um, Protestants of all stripes. Um, it's, it's racially diverse. There are academics and scholars. There are practitioners and ministers. I've never really seen an academic guild that has that kind of, of, of depth and fullness. Um, that said, uh, uh, and I think that's, a, that's about the power of his story. And so what, what, how do I understand the success of this recent biography? I think a lot of it is the story of Bonhoeffer's life is so incredibly captivating and compelling. I do think, however, it's very important not to want to um, create a Bonhoeffer in our image. And so it's, it seems a, a, a rather tricky move, at, at, the, at, the, at, the, at, the, at the very least, to, to want to craft a narrative of Bonhoeffer's life that makes conservative American evangelicals feel comfortable. I mean, I don't want to feel comfortable around Bonhoeffer. I want to see him in his strangeness. And I think one of the things that I began to uh, realize as I began talking to family and going over to Berlin fairly often, it's just how I've been, I've read, I've done a doctoral dissertation, I've written books, uh, academic books, and, but how, how, how completely strange this person was. He, he was a passionate lover of Jesus. He grew up in this family where that was really considered very odd. He had um, far-ranging taste. He, his, his politics ranged from um, fairly kind of traditional uh, German kind of, you know, Weimar Democrat to, you know, speculations on, you know, the, a possible monarchy coming into place in the years following the war in, in Germany. He's a very complicated character. Um, and, and so, um, well, what, what could bring these 
groups together. Uh, what is certain is that from beginning to end, from um, the time, you know, Bonhoeffer comes back from Rome and starts writing his first doctoral dissertation at the age of 19 until his death, his whole imagination is pervasively Christ-centered. It is a Christocratic, Christocentric, Christomorphic theology that he presents us with. It is a gorgeous, artful, beautiful rendering of Jesus as Lord over all creation. And that's where I hope this unity would be forged. For more information about the Veritas Forum, including additional recordings and a calendar of upcoming events, please visit our website at veritas.org.